Okay, well, welcome back, everybody. So uh, we're, we have our final session today on investments in energy efficiency, and we have two very nice papers. Uh, the first by Dwight Jaffe and Nancy Wallace on uh, market mechanisms for financing green real estate investment, which is going to look at perhaps trying to increase capital flow to green building. And the second by Lucas Davis is uh, an, a, an analysis of um, whether renters are less likely to uh, have green appliances in their homes than, than homeowners. And both are quite interesting and, and quite related to one another. Uh, quick announcement, Aaron Swoboda, who was uh, one of our discussants, is ill. So he's not going to be here today. It's OK, he just flew in. It sounds like he has the flu, unfortunately. But he did make it to Berkeley. He's just in his hotel room. And uh, but that's right, that's right. But we have we're lucky to have Eves and now from the University of Stockholm, who will be our discussant, and then I'm sure that everybody here will have questions, so we can we can make up for the extra time. Okay, so first, uh, Dwight Jaffe, UC Berkeley, is going to present the paper on market mechanisms for financing green real estate investment. Okay, well, uh, there's always uh, some cost to being the last session on a two-day uh, program. One is that everyone has left, so I, we see who's here, and we're very grateful. Uh, uh, the second is it's all been said, uh, 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 and it's actually going to be uh, useful because a lot of what I th feared might be very uh, provocative and create dissent is actually seems much more in the mainstream. Uh, so, and I can probably save a few minutes that way. Uh, but secondly, I think our uh, conclusions and our main focus of the paper is really quite unique and uh, perhaps even stands out from a lot of the other papers. And you can already see the key word in the screen here, which are market mechanisms. So uh, I will, in, at least by halfway through the talk, I'll be talking uh, primarily about market uh, uh, mechanisms uh, for financing green uh, 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 real estate investments. How do I do? Uh, okay. Forward. Forward. Perfect. Uh, so, say some things that have been said before, but it's our starting point is, as, as everybody in this audience would know, uh, approximately 40% of all U.S. energy uh, is consumed within buildings. Uh, it's actually approximately split 50-50 between residential structures and commercial structures. Um, I think a lot of the American public doesn't understand that. I think they would assume something like 80% is in automobiles. Uh, and as you can see, it's only 28%. Uh, the second fact, which we thought as we started the research was a fact, but w frankly we haven't been able to document it, it's more of a, an assumption, is that European buildings uh, presumably are much more efficient than U.S. buildings. Uh, and it's remarkably hard to confirm that fact, and in fact some of our future research may actually try to do that. Um, the, the reason these two points start us off is it, it le led us to believe that there are going to be efficient investments uh, in, in uh, energy saving uh, investments in real estate, and they haven't yet occurred. And so we're trying to find where is the bottleneck, why are they not occurring, and what would be uh, uh, the solutions. Of course, one reason U.S. buildings are energy inefficient is that our price of energy is simply too low. It certainly doesn't include any of the social costs. And so I want to just be on the record that uh, uh, we, along with most economists, would certainly concur uh, with a first best solution, which is raise the prices and the market will probably fix it a lot. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but uh, that's not going to happen soon enough, so uh, onward. Um, what a lot of this conference has focused on already are uh, three categories of government interventions uh, that have been carried out to stimulate energy and uh, efficient investments in real estate. Uh, uh, and in all of these, I want to be clear, we applaud those efforts. We think they're beneficial. Uh, but our key point for, for discussing them briefly is uh, to point out that they haven't solved the entire problem. And so something else needs to be done. And that really motivates the uh, core of our paper. Uh, but just to make a couple quick comments on building codes, um, the reason they can't solve the entire problem is, first and foremost, they apply primarily to new buildings. And only 2 or 3 or 4 percent of the building stock is, is uh, uh, created each year. And so it's a long wait before you uh, uh, wait for everything to depreciate to zero and have all new stock. Uh, secondly, building codes by their nature tend to be prescriptive in nature. They say use this particular item. And in that sense, they don't really encourage 
encourage the market to innovate because if you come up with an innovative product that doesn't meet the code, uh, you're actually going to not be in the marketplace. So building codes, again, are useful, but they can't solve everything. Uh, on the d same thing is going to be true, I believe, for disclosure uh, uh, certificates, whether you're talking the European mode or the American mode of leads and things like that. Uh, we've had, so we now have several papers that confirm uh, that uh, having a building that's certified probably raises the sales price for that building, and that's a benefit. Uh, but that itself doesn't answer several further questions, and in fact, I think these further questions are much in doubt. One is, are the price increases that the uh, uh, buildings receive uh, sufficient to make it a positive NPV investment? In other words, was it a wise thing from a business perspective to have made the investments that, uh, that acquired the certificate uh, and, and then for benefited from the sales price? And I think we just don't know the answer on that. Uh, in fact, I think it probably varies dramatically across buildings. Uh, and then secondly, do these certificates really stimulate the um, uh, energy efficient uh, investments? It could be just a certificate effect that, that, that folks, that there are clearly investors and developers who intrinsically want a green building and, so, and they're going to want to show their employees or their uh, uh, um, uh, customers uh, or other stakeholders that they've done so, so they're going to value the, the certificate, but they may have very well carried out those investments whether the certificate was there or not. So there's just open questions. And the last category, of course, government subsidies, but with fiscal uh, uh, governments in fiscal uh, difficulty around the world, I think we can't be counting on that right away as, as a dramatic solution. So our paper takes off by saying we want to look for, for market solutions, uh, but really the first step then is we want to find out if and where there are private market failures and then see if we can sort of backward engineer from a, uh, 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 an identified market failure to a potential uh, 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 solution uh, to fix that market problem. Um, so I think it's useful to go slowly at this point in a sense and look carefully at if you were owning a, a commercial property and were thinking about should you be installing more energy efficient uh, uh, HVAC system or windows or lighting, uh, what, how would you go at it? And be a little pedantic, there's really three steps. One is you first have to know what are the available possibilities. If, what's the catalog look like? Um, and you would probably do that evaluation at a very low standard. All you would really want to make sure is that even at, a, say, a zero interest rate, it would be NPV positive. That is, it would be cash flow net positive, a very low standard, but, but one that you would start with. Then secondly, you would do a more serious NPV computation using whatever is your opportunity cost of funds, and, and you would get a rank ordering of, of projects. You would throw away the ones, of course, that were NPV negative, and you would start at the top uh, with, with the most NPV positive and go as far as, as, as you wanted to or could. Uh, the third step would be, now that I know what I want to do, I've got to fund it, and primarily that's going to be a mortgage market activity, and, and so, in fact, it's the mortgage interest rate and the availability of, mor of mortgage funds that then become the uh, 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 cost of capital that is going to go be used in, in, in step two. Once you start to realize these are the steps, it immediately uh, occurs, I think, at least it occurred to us, where the frictions are in this process. And it's that there's not a lot of information available on any of these steps, that, that you wouldn't, it's not easy to find out what are the right investments for my particular building, uh, what are their real uh, net present value, and whether I can get this funded in, 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 the, in the mortgage market. In fact, on all three of those scores, the answer is going to be very negative. So we're starting to think of uh, means um, uh, for, for developing systems, methods, tools uh, that would provide much more information on what is and what is not an efficient investment and convey that information, make that uh, information useful in the mortgage market, which we think is the, a, at least one key bottleneck in, in this process. So um, let me take a minute now to give you a little primer on, on mortgage markets. Nancy and I 
teach this all the time, but we've sensed from some of the questions in the audience here that this may not be plain vanilla to you folks, so let me just spend a minute telling you how the mortgage market in commercial real estate currently works. Um, it turns out it's, it's not rocket science. In fact, it's not really hard to, to be a co commercial mortgage lender. All you need to know are two ratios, one which is called the loan-to-value ratio, which is simply the ratio of the amount that you're about to make as a loan to the value of the underlying property. And your boss would tell you a good standard on commercial real estate is don't make loans that exceed 65% of the property value, and you should be okay. Uh, the second ratio is called the debt service coverage ratio, and it's the ratio of the net operating income that the property is going to earn, think of it as the net tenant rents, uh, the relative to the uh, uh, interest uh, and, and principal payments required on the loan. Uh, obviously, if you're a good lender, you're going to want to make sure the property is generating income in excess of what they are going to pay you. And again, your boss would tell you as a standard rule, uh, don't go below 1.25 as the uh, uh, coverage ratio and, and you should be fine. Both of these ratios are highly dependent on what is called in the real estate trade net operating income or NOI. And it is, again, not, not rocket science, it is simply the gross, it's the gross rental income which you're collecting from all your tenants minus you, the building owner's operating costs. It, it, it's clearly in the numerator of the, of the, of the uh, debt service ratio, it's, so it's clear it's there, but it's really every bit as important in the LTVR because the property value that's in the denominator of that uh, uh, ratio is simply the present value of all future net operating income, and in fact, that's exactly how they would be uh, sort of verifying or appraising the property. So it all comes down to um, uh, NOI, and here's the, the conundrum from an energy standpoint. Energy costs are not really apparent. They're, they're, they're hidden inside in a way that's completely opaque to the participants in the mortgage market. They're inside NOI and they're never revealed as such. Uh, the main mechanism that makes it such is that at least in U.S. commercial real estate, most properties are leased on what's called a triple net basis, which means there's a gross rent, uh, there's a net rent that the uh, uh, client, the, the tenant has to pay, but they then pay, the tenants pay their energy costs, their property taxes, and, and other sort of uh, fundamental operating expenses. So that's what it means by triple net. It means the property owner is protected from these. He doesn't have to worry about the energy costs or the property taxes because those are the tenant's responsibility on the standard triple net lease. And this is standardized into the software that all of these uh, mortgage lenders use called Argus. All it requires is NOI. It doesn't have a line item for energy costs because they're being paid by the tenant and the tenant's rent is the key component of NOI. That's all we need to know. It's as if NOI was a sufficient statistic and we couldn't care what the energy costs are uh, uh, per se. So that's how the mortgage market works today, um, and therefore it's not surprising, or the, the, the major impact of this is if a uh, property owner came in and said, I need a bigger loan because I'm going to make an energy efficient building, um, and it's going to have benefits to, to everybody, the lender would say, I, it's not on Argus here, I don't know what you're talking about, you don't have to do it as far as I'm concerned. So that, that's the, sort of how the mortgage market is, and it's the real friction or bottleneck. Now, if you're, if you're understanding this, you may have already been one step ahead and thinking, well, wait a minute, the tenant is paying the energy costs, so shouldn't the tenant be worrying about uh, uh, how efficient the building is? And you might even think that sophisticated tenants, in fact, every tenant, may be saying to their landlord, if you make the building more efficient so my energy costs are less, I'm willing to pay you a higher net rent because I save on my right pocket from energy costs. I'm certainly willing to share some of those savings with you, the landlord. But there's three conditions that have to be met for this to actually get into the uh, 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 process. First of all, the tenants have to be convinced that there's really going to be lower energy costs uh, before they're going to sign a lease, a five-year lease that says, uh, I'll pay you more rent. You, they have to be convinced there's a real savings. This is a, um, immediately, again, it's, an infor it's the same informational problem. We don't know how to document this uh, well. 
Secondly, if the landlords have to be convinced that they're going to be receiving higher rents before they're willing to make the capital investment. In other words, this landlord would have to be saying at the beginning, I'm willing to invest $10 million in this energy saving on the hope that I can convince the tenant to pay me a higher rent. And, and again, if you can't document it, you're going to be very concerned about it. So the bottom line is it, it, the whole system just is information starved, and everyone has decided to come down with it sort of like a lemons uh, solution in, a, in an Ackerloff market. Uh, the, the simple solution is don't do anything energy efficient, and um, uh, we'll all just deal with, live in these, these energy inefficient buildings, and that's sort of where, where the market has found the equilibrium. So that's, again, what, where, where we're going to try to make a proposal to fix that. So, and this is actually, I should say, this paper is a part of, it's really one of the initial stages of what Nancy and I hope to be a major uh, uh, project uh, over several years. Um, and so w what our longer term goal, and these are proposals, um, is to really develop a methodology and tools uh, for c computing, say, three kinds of scores that would be available to all the participants, to the property owners, to the tenants, and to the lenders. Uh, one which we're, we're calling the energy efficiency score will really provide a, 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 a actuarially a f a f a fair and, and accurate evaluation of the impact of, ener of energy costs uh, in a building based on its existing investments and given its, its existing systems. A second score, which is um, even beyond everything I've been saying, is none of these players worry about energy price or energy cost volatility. Uh, and, and so we want to, which is going to depend on how sensitive the building is to energy prices, which again it's going to be reflective of how energy efficient or inefficient it is, or how they've uh, otherwise hedged some of these uh, effects of uh, volatile energy prices. And the third, which is really our NPV measure, is to come up with a system that would allow a building owner to rank order what are the available investments they could take, carry out, uh, and then to carry them out starting presumably with the highest NPV first. So that's our, our longer term goal. Uh, I, I should tell you if you wanted to leave, we're not, we don't have them today, uh, but I think we've taken a significant step in the direction of getting them. Um, this is a, a much more complicated uh, uh, flow diagram of, of our grand design. Uh, I've just circled two pieces there. The left side is where we're computing these, uh, these three energy efficiency scores, and they have to come out of a data set and a, and a computations of a means of, of scoring these buildings. And the right-hand side is the information that's going to the tenants and to the uh, uh, landlord and to the lenders uh, so that they can all make these decisions. Uh, uh, in an energy uh, efficient manner. Um, okay. Uh, I know a number of uh, sessions have already, starting right at the beginning with Art Rosenfeld, have mentioned things about property uh, uh, tax assessed energy retrofits, or sometimes it's called PACE, Property Access Clean Energy. And Nancy and I have actually been thinking a lot about that uh, because it's another form of, of mortgage market lending. And in fact, everything that, that we're thinking about is not only consistent with a, the standard commercial mortgage market, but it's really reinforced by what's going on with these uh, property tax uh, abatements. And let me explain uh, how, how, they, how they work a little bit. Um, the basic idea is that uh, a, a, a district, a city, or a, a county even in California can create a, an assessment district in which the residents are allowed to carry out energy efficient uh, uh, investments and pay back the capital investments through a loan where the payments are on their uh, property tax bill. And this has a huge benefit uh, to all concerned because uh, uh, a lien on your property tax bill is about as good as it gets. It stands well senior to the mortgage lender. Uh, so it's likely to make the interest cost of the investment much lower, and it's likely to expand the availability. You don't have to, to argue with the uh, 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 bank to make you the loan. Uh, and these apply, at least in the California law, to both uh, residential and commercial. And so although I'm going to focus on commercial here, uh, there's a whole other th story we could be telling uh, very parallel to this on, on residential. 
Uh, but even this sort of pace type of activity still has the same informational problems that, that I've already outlined for the general market. The first is on all of these plans, the city must decide what investments qualify. Uh, you can't just say to every homeowner, do whatever you want because people will buy new television sets and put it on their property tax. So you actually need, the cities must um, have a plan by which they evaluate, by which they do a, an energy audit of, of these plans, but, and those are very hard to do, particularly if you get into commercial buildings uh, uh, because every building is unique. So again, our evaluation tools or our idea of focusing on creating energy evaluation tools I think is a key component to make pace real uh, for commercial structures. Uh, secondly, um, you, you, it's, it's very interesting, um, almost all commercial loans in the United States, the lender has put in a covenant uh, into the mortgage contract saying to the borrower, you cannot, without our permission, you cannot create a senior lien on this property senior to my mortgage. They don't want somebody else in front of them if, if, if there is a default. And so to make this operative on a commercial building, the property owner will have to get the permission of the lender to say, it's okay, I will allow you to create a pace lien that's senior to mine. Why would the mortgage lender do this? Well, if they think it's NPV positive, then the increase in the collateral value of the building will be greater than the, than the loan amount that's being put senior to you. If worst comes to worst and you have to foreclose, you'll actually have a more valuable building. But you've got to convince the lender that this thing is NPV positive and maybe distinctly so. Again, you need information. You need, you need a technique that you can sort of take it literally to the bank and, and convince them to sign off on it. Uh, apparently, the residential mortgages often don't have this clause, but in some of the cases, I think, uh, uh, a Desert Springs, California, they're requiring it anyway, and so they're requiring each of the residential participants to get a, their, their mortgage lender to sign off. If the mortgage lenders are being careful, they may say, well, what makes, me th what, what makes you think I should say yes? And, and people will need that documentation. Okay, so um, let me now get to, to what we've really done in the paper, which is to create a, uh, a model and a, and, a, and, a, and a mechanism for carrying out a Monte Carlo simulations of stochastic energy prices on building NOI, a lot of big words. Um, the um, idea here is that th we're really concerned, if you're concerned about future volatility of energy prices and you're worrying about how the mortgage lender is going to be looking at this process, um, you really want to have a way of evaluating the tails. Uh, you may know most of the time energy prices stay the same, um, and, and so there's no real problem with, with the buildings as they are, but you do know they're volatile and that there may be distinct uh, uh, cases in which the high energy costs either cause tenants to, to break the lease, to fail because they go bankrupt um, uh, and therefore you, the, the lease is broken or it causes the property owner to default on the mortgage. All of that default behavior occurs in the tail and so you need some way of determining what are the tails of energy prices uh, and then computing the effects they have on NOI and therefore on default rates. This is the, the technique to do this, which I think is, is, I mean, we know that some folks in the energy space are doing it, but it seems like most people are not. It really requires a stochastic simulation of future energy prices. Um, and, and what you need to do is, is create a stochastic model, uh, calibrate it to actual data with real volatilities in it, and then you compute, you do random samples. We've done, I think, a thousand paths in our case. We have a thousand different uh, uh, energy paths. They reflect the, the probability distribution that's in the model that we've created. You can then compute the effect it has on NOI, and you can then look at the tail distribution of that and say, gee, 10% of this bill, of this building will, de will, will default 10% of the time at its current energy configuration, and the lender might say, why don't you go back and make some investments that hedge this risk, that, that make the building much safer in one dimension or another, and we might be willing to offer a larger loan or, or a better interest rate. Um, so we're only at the first stage. Um, when you get to a, a more sophisticated model, uh, you can also have more than one state variable. In, in this jargon, the energy prices so far are our only state variable. You can have interest rates, you can have ac economy effects, you can have property price effects, you can build in the correlations between them, and you have a really serious evaluation tool. 
This kind of technique of stochastic uh, simulation is already used in the mortgage market. The only sense in which they have any claim to being rocket scientists is they well understand the risks created by fluctuating interest rates and property values. And so to show them evidence based on Monte Carlo simulation actually I think has already a pretty receptive audience there. But we have to do it for energy prices, which nobody has, has ever done. So our, our pro we started with just one building. Um, it's a prototype. We tried to get what, what in finance we would call the representative uh, uh, firm or, or uh, the representative individual. This is a representative building. Um, it's, it's, it's an actual building. It's in San Diego, California. You can see it's got 225,000 square feet. Uh, the, it's office building. The tenants are uh, financial, uh, insurance, and real estate. Uh, it's about $127 million uh, building at its recent sale. Uh, and we know at the sale time, because everybody in th this market uses it, we know exactly what the NOI was, was at, at that date, about $8.8 .8 million. On the right-hand side, we show you the um, 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 CS uh, printout from this building. And so you actually can get from the database um, a, a fair amount of the detail. We're not really going to use this detail at this point, but if you were doing comparative simulations, if you wanted to say what happens if you change your heating system or your cooling system or your lighting system, it would just be, you'd just have a, a bigger spreadsheet and this stuff would all come fl flying out and you could simulate different investments. But we're just taking this, uh, this building as a whole now and we're simply going to say what happens to the market value of this building under different uh, energy scenarios. So we, we now need to build in the stochastic energy process. Um, the, the, buildings use, uh, the building uses both electricity and natural gas, so we have two energy sources. Uh, uh, in this literature where people do uh, evaluate stochastic processes for energy prices, they use this orenstein ollenbeck process, which has some very desirable uh, and realistic pro uh, uh, properties such as mean reversion. We're assuming a 90% correlation, which is roughly the case, between electricity prices and natural gas prices. There you can see the literal equation in terms of the kind of dynamic structure. Uh, it has lots of parameters in it, and you, you calibrate those to history. I, I show here just the natural gas history that we calibrated to. We equally well calibrated the electricity equation to a comparable picture of electricity prices. So what is the energy and the variables? Pardon me? What? Yeah. So th those are the changes in energy prices. And G? Uh, e is electricity and G is gas. So we have, we're, we're modeling the two separately. And we're assuming a correlation between the innovations in them, the DWs, uh, to be 0.9. Uh, we simulate 1,000 paths. <laughs> this is only about, what, 50 of them. Uh, but it just shows you, you get 1,000 different paths. And it, at every node, at every, we're doing it monthly, at every month, the model makes a random selection. You either have an uptick or a downtick based on the properties of the volatility of the process. Uh, one thing you can see immediately is there's a very strong seasonality in, in, in energy costs, which isn't surprising. And it really stands out as a distinctive feature of this particular data set. But uh, you know, uh, so anyway, so this, this this is the raw material, and literally we will have the time path for five years, 60 months, a thousand different paths, and we know every month what, if, if we went down that path, uh, that would be the price pattern. What, what you then can do is aggregate that thousand paths into something useful, and what I show here, the blue line is the um, uh, uh, net op monthly net operating income at the purchase date, at the beginning of our simulation. So that's about 127,000, um, forget it. No, it's about $360,000. It's about 30,000 per month times 12 would be the annual. That's a flat number, it's just a, a given at the beginning. The green line that's bouncing around it is our, the average of our 1,000 simulations. And it shows you that our thing is pretty well calibrated, or the building had a reasonable uh, NOI based on, on, on its energy use. Uh, and so uh, um, it, obviously, if we have the green line, this building is going to be in good shape. Whatever the underwriters saw on the beginning date, uh, you get very few cases where the uh, operating, the electricity costs far exceeded that initial amount. 
The black line, however, is a one standard de deviation, uh, which is to say at least 16% of our, uh, of our uh, uh, paths exceed that amount. And any one of these, uh, um, um, you giving me minutes or? <laughs> One minute, okay, I couldn't see it. Um, we're pretty close. Uh, uh, the top, uh, anything that exceeds that means that you've got significantly higher than, than original energy prices. And we can calibrate, we could do two standard deviations and so on and so forth. So that's what the electric uh, power cost simulations demonstrate. Uh, this is the same thing for the natural gas. Again, you, the seasonal shows up very strongly here too. Uh, but, and you can see the, the uh, we can compute this upper band of a one standard deviation or, or higher and, and that's where you get in the you know, potential trouble. And really, the next to last slide is how do you now take that simulated energy price information and translate it into something uh, that you would show to your lend lender or to your tenants or whoever? And the answer is you create a histogram in a sense. This shows the histogram of net operating uh, uh, income that the property would have gotten incorporating these changes in energy costs based on the various simulations, where I've drawn the vertical line at about 127 uh, uh, million is where the building, actually this is the present value of the building. I've actually computed, the, or Nancy has computed, the present value of the NOI which are being generated off of the energy pass. So these are alternative va property valuations looked at as a present value taken at time zero at the beginning of the simulation but based on the thousand different paths. And what, what, and, and the, the true value of the building was about 127 million. That's what it sold for. I've drawn a, a red line there. All of the cases to the left, all of the outcomes, and we have about um, uh, 100 outcomes to the left of that line, which is to say about 10% of the time, because we've done 1,000 paths, um, those are paths in which the building will, because of rising energy costs, will fall in value. And those are all potential default states uh, if you're the mortgage lender. And the sort of the idea would be this is just one run. What you would do is either is 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 evaluate this picture for different kinds of investments and see which ones concentrate the uh, uh, curve so you don't have as much of a tail. And if they're NPV positive, of course, they will move the whole curve to the right. Uh, so that's the sort of payoff. This is only our first prototype, uh, but that's, that's where we are, and I think I can stop here. So uh, that's a great paper. So next we have uh, Lucas Davis, UC Berkeley, evaluating the slow adoption of energy efficient investment. Are renters less likely to have energy efficient appliances? Okay, thank you. I'm, so I'm delighted to be on the schedule. Thank you. Uh, this, is, this is brand new work. Uh, very much welcome comments. Uh, the, the, the research question is in the title, the subtitle, Are Renters Less Likely to Have Energy Efficient Appliances? So public discussion of the Waxman-Markey bill has overwhelmingly, and I think correctly, focused on the cap and trade program that would be established for carbon emissions. It's interesting, though, as we learned this morning from Max and Mac, Matt, that the bill also includes new building codes. Turns out it also includes new standards for household appliances. We've had such standards in place, federal appliance standards in place in the US since 1988. Uh, you see that periodically they get, they get reviewed. So she, I'm going to be looking at refrigerators, clothes washers, dishwashers, room air conditioners, four out of the first six appliances here. And you see that as technology warrants, these, these standards are, are reviewed periodically. Causation is difficult here, but we do know that this implementation of these standards has, has gone along with pretty dramatic improvements in energy efficiency in appliances over this period. So this, if you look at, for example, energy in intensity of refrigerators, which is the diamonds, Goes from, a, goes from 100, unit, 100 kilowatt hour, well, this is normalized to 100, uh, down to 30 over a 30 year period. So, we're, so uh, dramatic, dramatic gains in energy efficiency. But it raises the question, so why, are, why, are, why is this other stuff on the table? If we're gonna have a cap and trade program, you know, why do we need this other stuff? 
Uh, does it make sense to use these, use these standards in conjunction with some kind of a Pigouvian approach? What's the economic rationale for adding standards? So now I'm going to put exactly what this, 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 uh, this, this list is exactly what Randy put up earlier today. Evidently, there was a list like, like this up uh, yesterday, too. Supporters of standards argue that, it, that they address additional market failures that would not be solved by cap and trade. So I'm going to kind of, I'm going to really focus in on one of these principal agent problems, and in particular landlord-tenant problems. It's not the only principal agent problem. We think develop relationship between developers and builders. There's a, there's a potential for split incentives there. I was thinking about rental car companies. Um, certainly when you, when you, when you select that you want a compact car, car you, my experience from showing up at the airport is, it, is, it's, is it's rarely the highest quality car within the, within the, within the, range of compact cars. So I think there's a, there's a problem there. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of discussion recently about cable boxes, so relationships between cable TV companies and consumers. Host of principal agent problems. I'm not going to, we've talked a lot about information problems, so that's the benefit of going last. I won't go through it again. Positive externalities from adoption, and then all of this is exacerbated by, potentially, by behavioral problems, if you're worried about status quo bias, or I think salience effects. What's, I think we, we, we know that consumers respond to, to characteristics that are psychologically vivid or observable, and when you're buying an appliance, that, the purchase price is really, is really vivid, so it may weigh disproportionately in these decisions. Okay, but landlord-tenant problem. So what do I have in mind here? The, this is a classical principal agent problem. I guess I think of a principal agent problem you have any time one, is is, one person is spending another person's money. This is, this, this, and this is what happens here. The principal, the tenant, is really contracting with the agent, the landlord, to pr for, the, for the landlord to provide housing services. The problem, though, is that they have different incentives. The, uh, the, the, the tenant would like to have high quality services, including high efficiency appliances uh, for lower, 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 like lower energy bills. This is expensive to provide, though, for the landlord. So is, as uh, Dwight described really aptly these informational problems, you may, you may have kind of a lemons problem where the landlord is going to balk on these, on these investments. Now, you could imagine no principal agent problem. You could imagine that in theory, these energy efficiency uh, investments would be perfectly capitalized into rents. I think, though, there's a strong case to be made that may, made for, for it, it, although certainly partial capitalization is possible, it seems like there's a strong case to be made that, that this is not going to be, you're not going to have perfect information in these cases. Uh, potential tenants when you don't have a lot of experience in evaluating energy efficiency of, appli of appliances or other, because hey, this, I've talked a lot about uh, appliances, but I think it's even more difficult when you, when you think about investments in building shell to come out, you know, as a potential tenant coming into a home, what ability are you going to have to really evaluate insulation or uh, the quality of the ductwork? It's going to be very, very difficult. Yes, of course, yes, the landlord has an incentive to talk about the investments, uh, but it's, it's not clear how credible that's going to be. And overall, we might think that this market failure is big. There's 33 million rental housing units in the U.S. So uh, if this stuff's going on, it, this could be a big deal. This has been widely discussed. Uh, so I, I, I cite a number of really good, good papers here that have discussed this problem. The earliest paper I know is the Bloomstein, Bloomstein 1980 paper uh, that has a really nice discussion. I also really like this survey paper by Gillingham et al., 2009. As I sat down to, to, to get into this, I didn't, really, I didn't, wanna, I didn't wanna want to write an, uh, another. These are great, sur great surveys already exist, so I thought it wasn't socially beneficial for me to discuss this problem too much more. I wanted to actually try to come up with some empirical evidence, because I, my reading in the literature is that, is that the empirical side is really uh, behind kind of the discussion here, that there's really not a lot of available empir empirical evidence on this. And so I'm going to do uh, 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 kind of the, this seems like the simplest possible thing you could do. I just want to compare ownership patterns of appliances between homeowners and renters. So I'm going to use, uh, I think, an underused survey, the Residential Energy Consumption Survey. This is a nationally representative in-home survey conducted every four to five years by the Department of Energy. There's 11 waves now. Uh, I'm going to use the 2005 wave. The 2010 wave hasn't started yet. The, there's a couple of nice things about this survey. So one is that you know a lot about the appliances owned by the home. A lot. There's a terrific amount of detail there. Yes, you have demographic characteristics, including household income, and a lot of stuff you'd have in a lot of other surveys. The other thing you have in the RECs is accurate information about energy prices. A, 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 they ask you, when they come into your home, they ask you where you buy your electricity, why you, where you buy your natural gas. 
they then follow up with the utility and actually request billing, billing data for, for, for you. So it's essentially noise-free measures of, of uh, energy prices and consumption, which is good. Okay, so comparing homeowners to renters. I'm just gonna put up a bunch of mean characteristics. So you have mean characteristics of homeowners and then mean characteristics of, characteristics of renters. The last column I put up p-values from, uh, from tests uh, test that, the, that the two means are equal. And what you see very quickly is that homeowners are very different from renters. They have higher levels of, of household income, much less likely to be on welfare, older, uh, uh, less likely to be non-white, uh, more likely to be in suburban and rural areas. They're different. And so this is going to underscore kind of the big empirical challenge in a study like this. How can, you, how can we possibly make any, any comparison uh, between these groups? They're very different. Uh, climate and energy prices aren't as different. They're a little different just because house, homeowners and renters tend to live in different parts of the country. Um, but I am going to, so I'm going to make a go of it, go of it here. Uh, and th what allows me to make a go of it at all is the fact that this last wave of the RECs asked a question, is your X, cert X appliance here an Energy Star appliance? They asked this about refrigerators, dishwashers, room air conditioners, and clothes washers. This is actually very unusual. I don't know of any national, nationally representative survey that's asked anything like this. We, we often will know what, uh, what appliances households own, but I've never seen a question like this that asks about energy efficiency. I actually asked them about it. They said they, said they just thought it would be a good thing to ask. To ask. It just kind of uh, it came along. Uh, but, but it is worth saying that just that uh, appliances, we just know much less about appliances. Uh, we know a lot about vehicles, and there's uh, uh, many people in the room who contribute to literature on, on vehicles. We know a ton about where energy efficient vehicles are sold, where they end up. We know the zip code level, how many people have purchased Priuses. We know almost, you know, we know very little about energy efficient appliances. Uh, so this is a chance to at least you gotta, you gotta make a step towards knowing something about this. Uh, so the question is this, though. Is it an Energy Star appliance? What does that mean? And do, do, do respondents have any idea what this possibly means? Here's what it means first, and then we can think about whether they have any idea what this means. Uh, energy Star is, uh, since, has been around since 1992, and this is a separate set of standards uh, that's established for most, ma most major appliances that designates the most energy efficient appliances in a particular class. It's a voluntary program, but in practice, all manufacturers um, uh, participate in these labels are typically prominently displayed. Uh, okay, if you look then in the second block there, yeah, here are the means. But comparing homeowners to renters, who, who, who reports having Energy Star appliance, appliances? What you see is that for refrigerators, dishwashers, and clothes washers, uh, homeowners are much more likely to report having Energy Star appliances. And in some cases, Dishwashers, you know, this is three times more likely to report having a, an Energy Star dishwasher. These are unconditional means, so we're, we're, we're actually confounding saturation levels, which are shown above, and Energy Star uh, saturation. That's why I'm going to move to, that's one of the reasons I'm going to move to regression framework in a second. But on the, the simple answer to the question, do renters have energy efficient appliances, just uh, descriptively, yes, yes, they appear to. And whether or not you condition on saturation, they report having energy star appliances. Now, that's kind of, that's 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 kind of interesting. But we'd really like I, I'd really like to know to what extent are these differences, at, if at all, driven by the, the landlord tenant problem, driven by the principal principal agent problem. And to do that, you'd really want to know well, you know, is it is it the, is it is it these informational asymmetries between homeowners and renters, or is it all this other stuff that I showed? Is it house differences in household income? All these different differences. So I'm going to move to a regression framework, and here's what you, here's here's what you find. What I have here are five separate regressions. Um, and along the top here, I'm reporting the dependent variable. So these are, this is a linear probability model. So these are all just the dependent variable here, for example, is uh, do you have an Energy Star refrigerator? These are all ones or zeros. And I'm re I report the mean for all of these. Um, I then am only going to report one coefficient. If you really want all the numbers, I can give them to you. But this is the one I want to focus on. And it's, it's, it's the coefficient on a dummy for whether you're a renter. So I'll say what I'm controlling for in, in one second. But, what, but the way to interpret this is that everything else equal, uh, renters, renters, uh, 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 renters are 6.7 uh, percentage points less likely to have uh, Energy Star refrigerators compared to a mean of 22%. So this is a, a big effect compared to a 22% uh, mean. Uh, 
dishwashers, 9.7 percentage points. Uh, consistent with the means, I don't find anything for room air conditioners. I think, I think you know, upon reflection, I think room air conditioners really are different here, probably not subject to the principal agent problem. They're much easier to move, and at least when I've rented, but uh, you, you know, you can, you can just bring your, if you don't like the, the room air conditioner that's provided, in many cases it's not provided, you can just bring in one of your own. Uh, so not finding anything for room air conditioners, finding something for clothes washers. Then in the last column, what I do is stack these. So I allow, I allow the, the, the coefficients on all the control variables to vary flexibly across appliance, and I, and I just get one mean effect across all appliances. So, and for all appliances, it's a 5.5 percentage point effect. What am I controlling for here? So I'm controlling for a cubic in electricity prices, a cubic in household income, uh, uh, whether you're employed, whether you're on welfare, how many household members you have, uh, whether you live in an ur urban, suburban, uh, 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 rural area, census division and available state indicators, and cubics in heating degree, degree days and cooling degree days. So is this the principal agent problem or is it something else? The, the, so, you maybe ha you already have half a dozen idea, uh, uh, other explanations in your mind. Here are some that here are some that I think are important. Some of which I can do something about. Uh, homeowners may have better information about Energy Star. For one, they may have purchased these appliances. They may simply know that they're Energy Star because they purchased them. A renter do renter may renter may not know. Uh, differential depreciation rates. Another reason. So what we've seen we've seen is just descriptively. You don't see a lot of Energy Star appliances in in. Uh, rental occupied units. One thing landlords may be doing is knowing that their tenants are going to be rough on their appliances. And so w what are you going to do if you think your appliances, if you may show up in your unit one day and see, find all the appliances gone. Uh, if, if that's the world you're living in, you want to, you want to buy cheap, cheap durable goods. Uh, so that, that's, that's, a, that's consistent with this. And then emitted variables. Um, so I think it, you, have to think, you have to think a little bit harder than you might think that I would have thought at first blush to tell them in a bit variable story. It's not about the renters here. Like, you might think that renters, renters have different discount rates or different, uh, or different, uh, 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 different time horizons, but that's not going to matter. The renter's not facing an intertemporal trade-off here. The renter's just facing a, a, rent, a rent, rental price and an energy, and an energy bill. Uh, you have to tell a story about landlord preferences being different than homeowner preferences. And when you start going down that road, well, you, to, 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 to get these, you need to, have, um, you need to have preferences that work in that, in that direction. And, and I think you can, I can't rule out, uh, I certainly can't rule out emitted variables. But let me show you a couple of the things I've done to, at the edges begin to think about these alternative explanations. One thing you can do is that the typical emitted variables problem, what you, you'd really be worried about is that as you control for stuff, you see the effect getting smaller and smaller. <coughs> So I show the results here. This is the class. I kind of try to avoid this. I, I hate these kind of, you know, tables just go like crazy in these papers. But I think there's something here, which is that, um, you know, so this is as you control for more stuff, what happens to the, co to the coefficient on renter. Um, interestingly, so you first control for household income, and as you, as, as you would expect, as I expected, that coefficient goes down, doesn't go away. Um, we, why? Because we think part of the reason we find you get in the un, without controlling for anything, part of the reason you find renters without energy star, energy yeah. efficient appliances is because they have, as you saw in the descriptive statistics, they have lower income, and maybe that, that uh, lower income households simply uh, demand less of everything, including less high less high, high quality. Um, what's interesting, though, and I, I didn't expect, was that as you control for some of this other stuff, like the age, age of the household head, as you control for uh, suburban rural, as you control for electricity prices, they actually go the other way. And in this, and, and, and this, in the case for refrigerators, you actually go back up and actually end up with a point estimate exactly where you started once you control for what I have to be able to control for. That, that is pretty uh, consistent across appliances that I'm finding, whether you control for stuff or you don't control for stuff, I'm finding these negative and statistically significant coefficient on, on, on renters for three out of the four, these three out of the four appliances that I care about. <laughs> um, another thing we can, another, again, nibbling around the edges, thinking about this informational problem, you were, you were in response to the question, you were able to answer, I don't know, which seems uh, reason, I think that's pretty reasonable that people, some people wouldn't know whether their appliance was Energy Star. Turns out, no matter what I do with those don't know responses, it doesn't change this result. Another thing that I, I, I know that uh, many manufacturers are now increasingly putting on an actual plastic 
label on the corner. I've seen this on the corner of, of refrigerator doors that actually is the Energy Star uh, brand. It could be that through that or through just through um, new appliances being easier to, to determine whether they're Energy Star or not, you might think, you might think that this, this, this problem about owners having better information than renters uh, might, be, might be different if you, looked at, if you controlled for appliance age. And so, but when I look among households with appliances under 10 years, under 5 years, under 2 years old, you, you see the same, same thing. Another thing you can just look at as a, uh, is, is a proxy for this. If you're just convinced that this Energy Star, Energy Star is meaningless, no one's going to know what, what, what Energy Star is, look at front-loading clothes washer. So this is uh, whether a washer is a, is a front-loading clothes, wa clothes washer is a pretty good proxy for energy efficiency. Uh, and it's, more sa it's potentially more salient to everybody. Now you'd say if it's really more salient, maybe it, sh it should have been capitalized into, into the rinse to begin with, which I, which I agree with. But it's, it goes, it's con goes in the same direction. Uh, un unconditionally, 9% of homeowners own front-loading washers in this sample, 2% of renters. And when you control for stuff, it's similar. OK, so I, 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 I think uh, uh, not, uh, not to lighten the emitted variables and other concerns I, I put up, what if you do take this seriously? How big of an effect is this? It implies, it implies that there, uh, there are 7 million fewer Energy Star appliances in the US than there would otherwise. So the thought experiment is here is here if we could somehow give renters the same fraction of Energy Star appliances that homeowners have controlling for observables, um, how, much, how, how, much, how much less energy would we be, be using? And it turns out to be, I, turn, tur, I get 7.2 trillion BTUs. Is this a lot? Is this a little? Well, this is one third of 1% of, 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 of residential energy consumption by renters. That, uh, so at first I thought, well, that, that doesn't sound like very much. It's not, well, I, I don't know. I don't know it is or, it is or it's not. A couple things to keep in mind. These are just some, these appliances aren't, um, represent about a third, a, a third to a half of total uh, uh, energy consumption in rental, in rental units. We're not moving, when you move from no energy to energy star, you're not, it's not like moving from not having a fridge to having a fridge. We're talking about 20, 25% improvements. And we're not talking about, in this thought experiment, giving all renters an energy star appliance. We're just, try, we're just trying to get, get up to the rate of homeowners, which was not a terrifically high rate. So I think that's how you get to this, this, this third of 1% um, impact on energy consumption. Uh, $73 million annually and 127,000 metric tons of carbon emissions. That's, that's what it implies. I do, think, you know, I do think there's reason to think principal agent problems would be uh, larger in, in insulation and in, in uh, uh, HVAC stuff, so you may think that this is suggestive of larger, large, of, of larger effects going on elsewhere, uh, but that's what you get. Let me, let me just conclude with a, a couple quick, uh, quick remarks. I think this basically co um, uh, confirms conventional wisdom about the landlord-tenant landlord, landlord -tenant problem. I, do, I, I don't want to lean heavily on having identified the landlord-tenant uh, <laughs> problem. I think, it ends, I think I've kind of shown that it's, it's hard to do. Um, this is a difficult market failure to address with policy. We, uh, you know, so standards do standards standards do quote unquote solve the problem, but it, it's a it is a it's a crude tool um, for reasons for many reasons we've discussed. I have another I have another paper that looks just at clothes washers, and finds that the 2005 uh, uh, 2005 standards for washers made 83% of buyers better off, but actually 17% were made worse off. So that, labels don't do a great, uh, uh, or standards don't do a, a good job at dealing with heterogeneity. We know, we know that. There are other problems with standards. Um, another, another, I guess I want to get comments on one kind of a comp potentially complementary approach, uh, which we see a lot of, a lot more, what we talked about in the new house, in, in, uh, in the housing market, in the uh, used housing market, it would be to actually label the units themselves, rental housing units. So why not go ahead and, and uh, give Energy Star labels to units themselves? So that uh, you could go on Craigslist and see that, the, that such and such unit ha uh, was Energy Star. What is the, you know, why, why do we think these labels are valuable? Because as uh, Stefano, I like st what Stefano said about simplifying, providing simple information. I think it helps solve the information problem. It's something that people can understand. Um, so you, that, I think that, 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 that could do something. When, when do we implement something like this? Maybe this would be a good time to do it. We're just about to spend billions of dollars on weatherization. 
uh, this would be, uh, this would be, I, I mean, I worry, thinking about these principal agent problems, that landlords are not going to be, are not going to want, are not going to want to take, take advantage of these weatherization, even the most optimistic weather, uh, the, the weatherization plans I've seen still have the homeowner, uh, still have the building owner providing 50% 50 50 of the investment. Are landlords going to do that? I don't know. I mean, that's, that's where you run into this principal agent problem. Perhaps if there was this additional carrot of being able to become an Energy Star rental unit, that might provide uh, extra incentive. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Lucas. Uh, now we have Eve Zanow, the University of Stockholm. It's going to be our discussant for the two papers. First, thank you for the invitation. Uh, Joan, I mean, I, I'm not at all in the field, so I'm learning a lot, and that's good. Second, I'm not, uh, even I'm at Stockholm University, I'm not coming from Stockholm right now, like Bjorn, but I'm spending the year in Berkeley, so it's, I'm not jet lag. <laughs> okay, so before starting uh, my discussion, I want to have just uh, a, a general remark on, on, on the field and on, on what I've learned here uh, as, as an economist. I'm, what is striking for me, and I think maybe it's a good thing, is that the standard uh, that uh, this field has is very far away from the standard we have in uh, mainstream economics. I mean, what I've seen here, most of the papers that, that uh, has been presented are mostly reduced form type of paper. I mean, if you think of what economics are obsessed with now, you have two branches. Either you do like, you write down a model and you do structural econometrics, estimating everything and just trying to, to see what's going on with that, or you have field experiments obsessed with identification issues. Where here, I mean, uh, maybe it's not, but the, what I've seen so far, uh, none of these approaches have been adopted, and uh, it's interesting because it means that you have a lot of uh, room for uh, improving the methodology and, and what we can do. So that, that's uh, my general remarks uh, from that. So I will discuss this paper, and maybe I will use this kind of idea uh, to 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 um, strengthen my, my my discussion here. So uh, uh, the second remark is that uh, I'm going to start with a uh, Lucas paper, uh, and then to uh, the other paper by Jaffe and, and uh, Wallace, uh, because the first one is more a positive approach, and someone second one was a normative approach. So maybe it's more natural way of discussing. So um, let's start forward, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay, so we're not spending much time, but if you want to summarize what this study is doing, basically it's comparing uh, uh, appliance uh, ownership uh, pattern between ownerships and, and, and uh, renters, and use, is using this nice uh, survey, as you said, uh, the RECS survey, and is using only one year, 2005, and basically uh, what he obtained is that, uh, as you've seen, uh, renters are less likely to, to use uh, energy efficient uh, appliance in this category of, 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 uh, of uh, problems. So um, my first question, I guess you have already answered, but I'm not sure, is that of course you know, we want to have some kind of fixed effect of household and some type of panel. So why using uh, 2005 if you have so many years before? Maybe the answer is that uh, is that uh, the question about uh, energy efficiency is only 2005. I guess that's what you say. So otherwise, it would be nice to have a third panel. So um, now I have several questions uh, to be sure that I understand. So the first question that uh, I didn't write it, but I just think when I you were presenting, is the me measurement errors in the renters. So basically, you ask uh, owners and renters to declare uh, their uh, efficiency, uh, appliance, but I mean, it's clear that renters are less likely to report than the other one because they know less. If I buy a house, I'm going to be very careful. I'm going to check everything. I'm going to live there. But if you're a renter, you, I mean, you don't care. You just come and you spend like maybe a year. So if someone, someone asks you something, you say, well, I don't know. So you just say, you just say well, there's no or, or not. So maybe you have this uh, measurement error that can capture some of what you obtain here. That should be important to, to, to uh, deal with. The second question, which is obvious here, I mean, you have a, a clear simultaneity problems uh, in your regression. So basically, you are looking at the point of having Energy Star appliance, and uh, you see the renter, but what about the reverse uh, causality? I mean, it's, it's obvious that you can have this the other way around. You can, you can see that. Uh, um, so you, you, you're more likely maybe to, to have uh, and uh, so to adopt an energy style appliance if you are renters and vice versa. So you can have the, the, the both sides. And I want to, if you, if you think uh, you, uh, both make sense, and how can you, can you uh, disentangle the two relationships here? 
another question that, that uh, I wanted to ask you also, uh, what, what about the selection here? Uh, we know that uh, homeowners are unobservables that are different than uh, renters. So you, you only control for all of the observables. But there are a lot of unobservables here which are clear. And maybe this is all what you're capturing. It's nothing to do with homeowners and renters, but something which are specific characteristics which you don't observe in the data that just explain why they have uh, 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 ownership. Maybe you know, homeowners are more likely to be liberal, or they're more likely to be green, or whatever, uh, than other things. And so it's not a characteristic due to owner, but something that you don't observe. And that's, that, that could uh, capture also the, um, the issue. Uh, uh, what, one more thing also. Uh, Again, I uh, really want to see a, a model. I mean, you speak about principal agent model, but I want to write down the model to understand exactly what, have, what kind of mechanism you have behind that. There's a lot of principal agent model. Uh, and uh, one thing that I was thinking is that, of course, uh, the objection function of homeowners and renter are very different. Uh, homeowners really have long-term objective. And when you have when a house, it's not like for one year, whereas renters don't have this kind of objective. So uh, acquisition of, of uh, efficiency type of uh, appliance is very different. So if you write down the model explicitly with these two different objectives, like myopic behavior from the renters and uh, more dynamic type of uh, lo uh, forward-looking behavior, you have very, very different issues. And maybe you, you can uh, pin down some of them uh, if you want to test some equation. And, and we know that there is this kind of consensus in the literature, uh, as I know, is that homeowners are better at maintaining and improving their doings than renters. And this is correlated to, of course, to having better efficiency type of, um, of uh, appliance. So this could also ex explain some of, some of the, the idea. Uh, I don't know. So, uh, if you want to have policy application, first we have to sh be sure that we have identified uh, ownerships versus uh, versus renters, because I'm not sure what what we have shown. But the second thing, of course, we know that uh, ownerships uh, receive a favorable term in the in the in the in the U.S. So basically, if we if we agree with what you do, we should encourage much more ownerships, uh, because we we know that we will have better kind of uh, uh, green or efficient type of appliance. So this is one of the questions. What kind of things you think we, we should do uh, based on your analysis in terms of policy implication? So we, should we even do more uh, ownerships or, or, or things like that? OK, so, uh, so let me discuss the second paper. So one thing I have to say first, when I received the paper two days ago, uh, there were no simulation and no model. So OK, so I'm, I'm basing. But now I've learned from it, and, and I think I can, I can give you more, more, more I think I understand a bit better. Uh, so, uh, OK, so maybe I'm going to go quick there. I can uh, summarize what, what they're after. Uh, basically, the idea is that you have market failure, so you, you, you want to, to start from an economic point of view. And you have this problem of underinvestment in US buildings. So um, uh, as, as, as uh, you presented here, uh, if you cannot tax um, the price of energy, so there is three different mechanisms that you, that you can uh, implement, and the three of them that you have already uh, discussed. And what you say, basically, is that the three of them are not, uh, uh, they will not solve the whole problem. They will solve some of them, but not all of them. So, uh, so basically, the, this, this uh, paper is focusing on loan market friction uh, and, and try to, to address this issue. So the first thing is that, uh, yeah, so, and that's, you, you give the solution that, uh, that uh, you presented in a very clear way. So I don't have to go back again here. So of course, the first thing that I am a search theorist, so I did a lot of paper on search. So I said, what do you mean by exactly friction? I mean, uh, again, there's no model, so it's difficult to understand when you don't write uh, with formulas uh, what you mean by friction. Uh, so basically, um, this is the way it was defined in the papers. So basically, there were two definitions. Friction in the lending market raises the discount rate and lowers the NPV computation. And the second thing is that friction currently constrains both uh, owner lending and, and uh, mortgage contracts and the lease contracts. So basically, to my knowledge, this is exactly what search friction are. Uh, so in other words, you have a friction in the sense that you don't have perfect information on, on some, some aspect here. So you make decision with imperfect information, and this creates kind of, of, of uh, uh, inefficiency. So uh, my, my question is that well, you, you could write down uh, a search model. And there is this paper which is interesting by uh, uh, Vassmer and Vell in the, in the ER, uh, where they have, they have a search friction in the credit market, which is 
not exactly, but not far to what you do. But basically, if you write down a, a model with search friction, uh, you can see, for example, how the planner can coordinate, it, coordinate agent in, uh, to have efficiency. So basically, the way I understand and better when you present it is here, everything is a coordination problem here. So basically, you say, well, why, uh, as a renter, I'm going to pay a higher rent uh, if I'm not sure that I'm going to reduce my energy consumption? And the, and, and the landlord say, why uh, I will invest in this uh, appliance or energy efficiency if I'm not sure that the renter will? So there's a connection problems. OK, so we know that there's a different way of solving them. If it is with a search model, the planner can reduce the friction by, doing, by, by, by uh, providing information to, uh, to, to um, to, to, to the agents. Another way you can do that, there's a different way, if you now look not at a search model but a principal agent model, as you were referring, uh, it's basically a standard model of coordination under imperfect information. One way to do that is to have a learning process. And the labor market, we have like the piece rate stuff. So basically, what you the piece rate kind of, of model. So basically, what you do, you say, okay, we don't know. So we have a contract which is contingent on on on, on some outcome, which I don't observe perfectly, right? So I just say, okay, you pay this uh, rent for one year, and I, I promise that you're gonna have uh, 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 energy efficiency, which is gonna be decreased. And then after one year, of course, you can adapt the contract. So in the labor market, you do a lot of that. So basically, you have a, a contagion contract with depend on shocks in the labor market. And you can have fluctuation in that. So that's one way to, to solve these problems. Uh, another way is institution. So you can, uh, you know, like in the labor market, you can have institution that guarantees that this coordination can be, can be solved. OK, and, and that's, what, that's one way that there's room for policy that institution can have a, a way to satisfy. And, and, and so, so that's the two things that I was uh, looking at that. Uh, first thing that you were, um, you were mentioning about uh, the lemon problem, uh, but if, if it's a lemon problem, then you should observe that only the bad quality type of uh, building should uh, end up in, in the market, and, and the other one could be drive out. That's maybe what we observe. Uh, and maybe you should do some signaling to solve this kind of problem. So I don't know if signaling is something you could do, but that's, that's one way out. Uh, last thing um, about the stochastic model that I discovered here, uh, if I understand well, there is this two dynamic equation, but they're not uh, microfunded. There's no microphone. That there's no model behind this equation. You just write directly this equation. And I mean, as economists, I, I mean, we want to have behavior. We want people to maximize some things. And basically, here you see there's a principal agent model between the landlord and the tenant, and people are not trusting each other because they maximize utility. But these two equations just come from it's like the physics type of equation where you come from nowhere and just use, use simulation on that. But you could microphone that uh, this equation by having an explicit model and end up with this two dynamic equation. And from a search model of exactly this kind of, of, of equation you end up with in, in, in equilibrium. Thank you. OK, so we, if uh, uh, we can get Lucas and, and Dwight to come up, we have some time for questions. Uh, we did have some comments by, by Aaron. I think they're, they're rather specific in terms of they refer to page numbers. So I think maybe I'll just pass those on to the author. And I guess. Oh, they have them already. I'll, I'll use the moderator's prerogative to make, make a comment, I guess. Um, this might be a little naive, but it, it seemed from, from hearing these two papers and a lot of the papers today that one of the key challenges in, in sort of fostering capital formation towards energy efficiency is, is basically seeing whether or not the sort of innovations actually capitalize into prices that landlords can get. And that seems like a really important research agenda, both in the commercial and the residential real estate market. And I was just thinking about perhaps research strategies for getting at that. One, I was fascinated by Matt's uh, and Dora's paper suggesting that there's a lot of price variation that just occurs naturally with the year of birth. And I wonder if one could just exploit that variation and randomly assign certification and see whether or not that, that is reflected in price and whether that differs by uh, you know, residential, we, I would think anyway, would sort of be more likely to capitalize in commercial markets and residential, but I, I found it fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think that they're worth doing. Anyway, we'll go to the questions. Um, Alan Sands at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Uh, <coughs> question to uh, Dwight and Nancy. Um, first of all, I think your paper is, uh, your work is extremely interesting, long overdue, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it, it uh, goes forth. I have two questions. First is on the initial discussion of the, the, the Lemons problem, principal agent problem, if that's what you're calling it. So it's, it's, you know, it's sort of, you've, it's picked up in the last day. It's an article of faith among energy efficiency experts that this is a big deal. 
uh, in commercial buildings and you know in land on a tenant and so forth. Uh, even in the last day, though, I've heard um, different stories about this. So uh, my co-panelist yesterday, Dave Pogue, who works in the industry, said, well, you know, that's not really that much of an issue for us. We know how to get around these, these split incentives problem. Uh, there was also a, um, a paper written five years ago for the US DOE on uh, the commercial energy efficiency in the commercial market that made the similar point that the structure of leases, uh, which I know nothing about, but the way leasing work arrangements work in most cases in the commercial market allows the split incentive problem to be rectified or to be avoided in the first place. So my first question is, uh, is, was your discussion initially about this a finding or sort of a conjecture? I mean, how did you conclude, which I understood you to conclude, this is actually what's going on in the first place? Uh, my second question is, uh, as you, and I, I realize this may not be done yet, but how are you going to, uh, what I'm especially fascinated by, how will you figure out in your project what the payoff to the investments is? As we've discussed in different points in the last two days about the extreme uncertainty uh, of the predictions of payoffs in building simulation models, which are actually the tools that tend to get used. And they, the sort of lack of predictive, predictive value of those models on a, on a building specific basis. So I'm interested in what you might say about how you're gonna deal with minim, you know, uh, capturing and hopefully re reducing the risk of, the prediction risk on just what the, what the investments will do energy wise if they're undertaken. Thanks. So thanks for the question. Um, so the, uh, you're absolutely right in terms of these metrics and the development of the metrics. So that part of this project is being done at the labs. So I've been working with them for the last two years in terms of coming up with metrics. We're only focusing on four components of the buildings. Three of them are HVAC mm -hmm. and the other one's lighting. We may get to window treatments, we're not sure. Um, they've made some significant progress with some of this stuff with the New York Times buildings and other buildings where there are, um, they're instrumented so we know a little bit more and we are guardedly optimistic that we can come up with good metrics. I think the big innovation here and something, uh, particularly when you're talking to um, commercial real estate owners and operators and mortgage lenders is the problem in the mortgage market is these contracts are filled with options. The default option is priced off volatility. And it's a really, as we've all found in the current marketplace, this is a, can be an absolutely devastating exposure to lenders if it's not priced. And so what we really know very little about these buildings is their volatility, how well they respond if there are significant shocks. And in the modeling that I'm doing right here, I just have the seasonality. And if you looked at Arthur, Arthur's seasonalities with the spikes that we anticipate going forward, those are big potential shocks, and right now we don't have mechanisms to differentiate between buildings that could respond to those shocks and buildings that couldn't respond. Now, one way they could respond is through the derivatives market. So the way I fit this simulation is I used futures and options prices to get my drifts and volatilities, and I'm fitting off markets that are bets about volatility. I fit that off the tolling agreement, the spark spread market. So there is a market right now on the OTC where people are making exactly these bets, and then they do contracts with the utilities and strip the things off and sell them to hedge funds. Mm -hmm. And from that, you've got a derivatives market. That might be a solution. The other solution might be photovoltaic on the roof. I know Severin hates that solution, but some other solution whereby you can <laughs> respond to the peaks to take those peaks out because it's the, it's the volatility that's the problem for the capital market. And it's the same for the pay, PACE program. The PACE program, the plan is to have it funded off the muni market. Right now, the muni market will not step up because until we can show that there is an actuarial foundation for the valuation of these bonds, the fixed income market will not come to the market. And if we want to open our capital markets internationally, this has to be a, a, an international market to do the level of retrofitting that we think needs to happen. We have to have an actuarial basis for doing this. And that means we have to be within the standard option pricing literature. We have to use the same tools they do. And we have to show them that they're what the volatilities are in some credible fashion. And then how do you respond to them? because mitigating that risk is everything. So whether you have a catastrophic view of this, these are very fat tail distributions, and they're ignored. And I have hundreds and hundreds of commercial loans in my 
garage, much to my husband's um, unhappiness. And although there is an engineering report required for every commercial loan, and a commercial loan can be 200 pages thick, there is no mechanism whereby all of that information about the engineering of the building, the serious equipment that exists in the building, affects the bottom line in lending. So right now, in lenders' portfolios, they are blind to this risk. Not just the energy use, but just the performance of the equipment. Correct. They are totally blind to this risk. They have no idea if you have an energy star or you have anything, a chiller on the roof, that is about to break down. They know nothing. And it's that risk that's so dangerous for us because it, you know, it is being priced in the options markets. I mean, there are people watching this. And if we, want to act, if we want these markets to grow, we have to respond to the information that the capital markets are used to. And that has to do with volatility because basically they're pricing options. The big option here is default. And we're seeing a lot of it right now. We're even seeing energy defaults right now. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could I, uh, w uh, w just a, one more thing on the split incentive, which I think is just a, s a specific version in a way of what our discussion, which we really appreciate your c comments in, 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 in two days to get them. And I agree completely that the overall problem, a good way of stating it, and uh, it's very helpful, is to think of it as a coordination problem under imperfect information. And the answers then are, as you suggest, if under certain circumstances learning can do it, uh, uh, s sophisticated contracts, which you're suggesting they exist, or might exist, well, or someone has. I'm sort of what, I, quite honest. I'm wondering who to believe. Yeah. Okay. I both. Okay. <laughs> and then the third possibility is to think of it as a lemons problem, and and I think that's where we've really focused for the start because one solution to a lemons problem is to have full disclosure, get rid of the imperfect information, and and that goes away. Um, I think the problem with sophisticated contracts or learning in this context is that the uh, tenant. Um, um, landlord relationship is often very short term and the lender uh, t uh, property owner is a one shot contract and so sophisticated contracts are learning particularly but it's it's a very useful f uh, for framework for us to use and I actually very much appreciate it I have two comments or questions or suggestions I guess one is uh, for Lucas uh, before you, you sort of, I kept writing things down, you kept ticking them off, so I don't have, but this idea of reporting of Energy Star is sort of pretty worrisome. I, I would think that there's systematic downward bias of renters reporting Energy Star. Uh, one thing I wondered though, is you come up with a national representative number for Energy Star penetration. And there must be sort of other ways of coming up with that number. And it would be nice, you have 0 0.22 of something, I forget what is a washing machine, et cetera. Um, so uh, it would be nice to know if that roughly matches. On uh, your pa Dwight and Nancy, your paper, uh, this is obviously incredibly important. Uh, what's being done now is just uh, farcical. It's just stunning that, uh, but I guess it's not that stunning given other things that have happened in this market. <laughs> but I have to tell you, the route you're going worries me a little because it reminds me a little of sort of some of the discussion of future electricity prices that went on in 1998 where there was a lot of modeling of spark spreads and of natural gas pricing not much appreciation of the dispatch order that what's on the margin changes, that is the underlying economics, and no appreciation whatsoever of market power. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actually was told by a utility executive at that time when I, Jim Bushnell and I wrote the paper about market power risks and was told I, that he had no idea what I was talking about, that's never happened before. Uh, and of course, we hadn't deregulated the market, but it was. Uh, but I think it's important when you go down this road to not just sort of use the standard sort of time series modeling of price. Direct. So let me just give you one example. Uh, Dwight mentioned that you have a 0.9 correlation between natural gas and electricity built in, and that is completely dependent on what the margin, what's on the margin in production. Yeah. And you could very easily, if if the price starts moving, that correlation changes massively. Yeah. Different uh, technologies, and then in the more extreme, and of course we're worried about the more extreme outcomes. Uh, 
You get things like very dry years, very wet years. You get things like big breakthroughs in technology. And those are, gonna get, those are what's going to move you to the tails. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those things, I, and this is sort of nihilistic, but you know, those things sort of are, can't be modeled in this process because they are the sort of out of process events, which sort of worries me because it sounds like long-term capital and all those things all yeah. over again. Well, we mm -hmm. plan on becoming your best friend, yeah. Severin. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. So in terms uh, that, that, that suggests that I know the answer. <laughs> yeah. to these. I, I just know the questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Exactly. But I actually think this gives us a framework for s thinking about some yes. of these things. Yeah, I, I mean, we know the weather is a big component on this. And Dwight and I have done, well, we've had discussions with the Catbon people who are very focused on hurricanes and things like that, and the modeling that goes on underlying that, where the weather is a big channel. And so I don't, I agree with you. I mean, these are things that are going to be modifiers. They're going to, we could build shocks into this. Right now, I don't have any jumps in these processes at all. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of things we could have regime shifts. I mean, there are many things that we could think about doing. But I think at least it gives us a framework for where yeah, these things can be right. brought together in a summary statistic that the capital markets know how to use. And so I'm, I'm optimistic this will be helpful. But we would like to know more about all the pricing stuff because we haven't incorporated it at all. And, and I would just add this again is a special case to you. You you're raised the question, what are the micro foundations behind, behind these equations? And that has to all be done in a sensible way. And, and, uh, but you know, finance folks in, in uh, financial contract uh, uh, dynamic paths do, do OK. But, but you're com completely right. We have to at least have in mind and be able to tell you if you ask what is the uh, underlying micro as well as answering Severin for you know, we have jump processes or whatever. So right questions. We'll have future answers. Should we head to this side? Go ahead. Please. Um, Let's see, I think I had a couple of comments and a question. Um, comment, I just wanted to let you know that um, a commission decision recently charged the energy division where I work, energy efficiency section, California Public Utilities Commission, with producing a comprehensive report on financing options for energy efficiency over the next uh, nine months or so. Um, so we'll, someone will be setting up some workshops. It sounds very relevant and would love to hook up and learn from you and get your participation perhaps. Um, we'll also be hiring for that position soon if anyone has to be on the, happens yeah. to be on the we, state. We um, have you have to have the, be on the state, pass the state exam already. <laughs> um, so that's a little hiring, but consultants too. Um, and I guess my question was, um, I mentioned yesterday that the utilities are looking into developing this, I think it's called a universal energy audit tool, which would be obviously much simpler than this. I, I, I'm getting this is intended mainly for the investment mm -hmm. community. Yeah. Do you think this kind of approach would be too sophisticated to try and build in in some way into a utility No, I tool? actually think it would be really helpful. So we're also, through a student, um, well, why don't you talk about no, that? No, what, no. Uh, so we are also working with the PACE people in terms of, for housing, thinking about these energy audits and how they can be made usable. Because again, the link that needs to be made here is to the capital market. Right now, these are one, actually right now, the bonds for Berkeley are being held by them. They haven't even been sold yet. So it's going to be a one-off sale to a Canadian bank. They're trying to get the muni market to come to the table, but without metrics and without option valuation models that they're used to, this capital will not flow. And I think the advantage of having metrics they are going to be different for housing or commercial or whatever, or for scale of commercial, um, that we can value many different types of fixed income contracts, both operating contracts on, on energy for loans and also specific retrofit types of financing through taxes. So it's general in that sense, um, but obviously without the metrics, we're going to be limited. Yeah, and I, I mean, your universal energy audit, to, uh, that's the front end. Right. We, we sort of did a really simple thing. We just created a representative single building 
Uh, but we are, are very much our project involves trying to get real tools for that. So we'd be okay. interested in what your folks are doing and yeah. be willing and able to help if we could. Great. That'd be I'll great. We have time for one more question. Okay. Well, and um, <clears throat> as a non-statistician, uh, a, a lot of the presentation really was approaching it from, I think, the wrong end of a practitioner's view of financing. Um, clearly, there are so many variables associated with real estate ownership, and Nancy, you mentioned the capital markets and looking at derivatives, which takes it into the exotic financing from a, a real estate owner standpoint. Traditional bank financing, a lender asks for 65% LTV because that covers their risk in the event of a value drop because rents have dropped, uh, if, if costs have increased. Uh, your point that energy efficiency or energy savings are not reflected anywhere is, is technically true. It may not have a line item, but it's an integrated component of your NOI. If you have energy savings that flow to your NOI, your value, if your cap rates have stayed the same, will go up by sure. definition. Sure. Sure. And in a typical multi-tenanted office building, energy savings will flow to the tenant's benefit. So that you know, the, the landlord-tenant you know, differential argument that's being presented is true in that respect. But from a marketing standpoint, that building has become more attractive to tenants because the growth of their escalation charges is going to be flattened. Uh, they will, tenants that, that research their marketplace to find a place to locate will preference an efficient building. Uh, we spoke about this yesterday. Dave Pogue and a number of panels uh, spoke to the proxy that in an energy efficient building, uh, an Energy Star labeled building, or perhaps a LEED certified building, speaks to a, a shorthand for tenants who are searching the marketplace to preference specific buildings over others. Uh, you, you had the, the chart on the volatility and, and the effect that could have on the NOI of a property. You know, that's maybe presuming a triple net lease situation. There are many, many buildings out there, and I, I don't have a, a, a metric to it, but I would guess that a lot of the office building um, stock in this country is probably based on some sort of uh, gross lease where you have rent plus escalations or an, an operating stop. True, there are many markets that operate on a triple net lease basis, which are even more important for energy efficiencies to be implemented because the tenants see that escalation as a, as a direct charge, not as a, a calculation that happens once a, you know, once a year when you reconcile your escalations. Um, the other issue as a practitioner, the assumption that energy efficiency projects have to have a capital component. That's not true. There's okay. plenty of energy efficiencies that you can derive from operational changes, which mm -hmm. are not capital intensive. Mm -hmm. Leading me to my final observation, typically financing of a project, of a, an energy efficiency project, is going to be as a second mortgage, perhaps, or as an equity line or something. It's not your primary mortgage because none of those projects rise to the level of, of having to refinance the whole project. The $127 million San Diego project, you know, you changed out the chillers, you're looking at a two or $3 million program. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna refinance my whole building just because I need to change the chillers. Now, if my mortgage is coming due and I wanna package uh, a capital program in to a, an overall refinancing, yes, by all means. So the, the whole thing when I came in and saw the the, the title, Financing Green Real Estate Investments, I thought we were, you were going to be addressing the, the cap rate differential that could exist in a LEED certified building versus a non an identical non-LEED certified building or an Energy Star rated building versus a, an identical non-Energy Star rated building. Uh, the, M the Appraisal Institute so far has said there's no difference to them. Any value differential comes from whatever flows to the NOI Obviously, to my original point, greater NOI leads to greater value, assuming a, a comparable cap rate. And that cap rate affects your, your interest rate, which affects all of the other ratios. Yes, NOI is a critical element, but value is a market concept, and that changes on a daily basis as, as transactions occur. 
And unfortunately, part of the risk we have today is that there are so few transactions, appraisers are hard pressed to tell you that your building is worth this much because they just don't have enough transactional activity to, um, uh, to point to to say, here's what we believe a, a comp would, would represent. So sorry, I don't have any real questions, but I, I, I overall question the, 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 the focus. You have some? Yeah. Yeah, so just one, two, one short thing, and then Dwight's going to come on. Yeah. So when Dwight puts up a debt service coverage ratio of 1.25 or a loan to value ratio of 0.65, that comes from exactly the same modeling that I showed you. I mean, that's what we do. We design mortgage contracts, and we help banks value these things so they can sell them into the capital market. So all the research that's done to set those levels that are then quoted to you as like gospel, those are coming from actuarial studies of underlying processes that have to do with rents and interest rates. Mm -hmm. So it's, although it looks like, I mean, Dwight sort of represented as not rocket science, in fact, those <laughs> things come from models, a lot of models, that are then quoted to you and enforced by the comptroller of the currency and by the regulators. So this modeling is absolutely mainstream and mm -hmm. sets the tone for everything you do. Dwight, yours. Um, so I, you're completely right that there's non-capital investments, and we should we all agree on that. I think this, your comment on the second liens are right, but it, it actually reinforces our point because that's a very imperfect lending market, and so you need even better information. But the main thing, are you suggesting on the general contracting on this and, um, principal agent problem between the tenants and the landlords? that people have pretty much worked out those contracts in a way, that, are you suggesting that the energy efficient investments are being made by the landlords because they know the tenant will, will understand it and pay them a higher rent? I mean, I, Not enough landlords have done that. Oh, okay. The, the proactive okay. ones are on board, they recognize the long-term value differential and you know, to just yeah. use the case of the volatility in the energy markets, yeah. Uh, you, you mitigate that risk by implementing effective energy control measures yeah. that, that you have on energy efficiency. And okay. quite honestly, Energy Star is a, a wonderful metric to be able to differentiate yourself within a marketplace because right. of that imperfect information. How does one tenant differentiate a, a one building from another? We're, we're on the same page. Okay. Okay, folks. Well, let's thank our, our, our paper presenters and our discussion for great so we've, I wanted to uh, thank you all and commend you all for sticking it out for the past two days. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank the paper presenters for getting their papers in, even those who uh, got to have their uh, turkey dinner a little late, even if it was a tofu, tofu turkey that, uh, that Max claimed he was going to have, uh, uh, he had this morning. Um, beyond that, um, I wanted to thank um, Larry and Brian Rothberg for uh, organizing this and for making it work.